I'm Jules. I'm Brian. We're the, the Bomb Christian family. family. On October 5th, 2020, um, our family took a family vacation to San Diego um, at a little RV park. That late afternoon, Bowden fell off of his bike, scratched his knee, um, it was bleeding a little bit. We took him back to the motorhome, cleaned it up with Bactine, Band-Aids, and then he went on his way. The very next day, he woke up and he threw up, and my first thought was, gosh, I feel like every vacation we go on, he gets sick. He has two older sisters, he catches whatever they have. I was like, here we go again. And then he was lethargic on the couch all day, really not speaking. He had a low grade fever. So we were, you know, rotating Motrin, Tylenol. Hindsight, he was holding his knee a little bit here and there. He was holding yeah. his foot. Yeah, we thought he sprained his knee. Yeah, from the bike fall, we mm. thought he sprained his knee. There's no other, no other symptoms of anything, just of holding his, his knee, sitting up, making um, a little moan, laying back down, very lethargic, was taking liquids, ate a banana, went to the restroom. But we had to carry him, he would not um, walk. So we right. had to carry him when he needed to go to the bathroom. So now we're October 7th. So the wee hours of the next morning, he felt really, really, really hot. Boiling hot, And yeah. his breathing was getting rapid. And that's when we were like, oh, okay, this is, this is different. We should probably, well, actually I called um, an urgent care. I found an urgent care that was really close to the RV site. And I gave him the description and they said, hey, you guys should probably take him to the children's hospital. There's one nearby you took him to the hospital, literally on the way to the hospital. We noticed his knee that he fell on was swollen. Um, and lip, then yeah. just on the way, his upper lip was swollen, which was kind of strange because he didn't injure his face at all. Mm. His color was pale. It was pale. And you could see he was, he was sick. sick. Something was happening. Right. And thank God we were only 10 minutes from this hospital. I mean, it, it yeah. actually, hindsight's 2020, but I mean, thank God we were so close to that. We got to the emergency room and only one of us could take him in. And I, they took him right in, I think because of his breathing um, mm -hmm. was really rapid at that point. We were in the ER for hours and he was in the car, like what's going Out on? Front, and yeah. yeah. Trying to text and call in, this, in uh, hospitals you know, they're concrete and it's very difficult to get reception. So I'm just kind of out in the dark. Immediately, they started him on Benadryl, Benadryl. for the swelling. They got IVs going. Yeah. They took him for an x-ray to check out the swollen knee. And, and then I finally get to go in and I go to this room and I'll never forget Dr. Ravine wearing a bright orange dress shirt and there was 12 to 13 people in this room, visibly scrambling, trying to figure out what's going on, and um, major tension. Ravine Raviendran, um, one of the intensivists in the pediatric ICU here at Rady Children's Hospital. My name is John Bradley. I'm a pediatric infectious disease doctor, and I came to Rady Children's Hospital in 1988, which is <laughs> 35 years ago or so. And I was the first 
infectious disease doctor based at the hospital. So when I first saw him, it was concerning that his extremities were starting to become discolored and that he had a source of infection on his leg. My worry was that the infection had become systemic and it was in his bloodstream, but at the same time, I wasn't sure what exactly it was and if it was necrotizing fasciitis or another type of infection where I needed a surgical team to actually open up the wound and clean it out an MRI would have given our surgeons the best amount of detail to see exactly where that infection was localized. From the infectious disease standpoint, if you've got fever and skin findings that look like infection and horrible shock, th that's an infection by, you know, for me, by definition. I'm sure there are other things that can cause it, but the question is figuring out what it is and making sure that we've got an antibiotic that can kill whatever it is that's causing that infection. On a scale of, nine, of one to 10, his infection was probably a 15. We tried to just start him on a little bit of sedation to keep him still for the, the MRI. And he immediately had respiratory and cardiovascular collapse. And so his blood pressure started to go down very quickly. He was so sick that he couldn't do the MRI. So they put him, admitted him to the ICU um, unit, pediatric ICU. He was that far yeah. into his body shutting down. We had no idea even at day one, day two of any signs. It just happened so fast that it was just taking over. This, this poor little innocent boy that's three years old and you know, totally healthy, uh, healthy pregnancy with my wife, healthy delivery, healthy until three years old. And then this to take over his body is just, very foreign to us or any parent, I think. My name is Audrey Larson. I am a PICU nurse here at Rady's. I have been here for four years now. My name is Victoria Young and I am the child life specialist in the pediatric intensive care unit at Rady Children's. Almost every machine that we have, he was on. So it made the room very chaotic as well. There was a lot going on in the room. And I remember meeting Jules and Brian in the back of the room when all of this was going on and explaining my role and reassuring them that I would be there to help him process, to help them process and cope, and to help the siblings as well. Because in that moment, they're just worried about their kids. I mean, it was like a spaghetti bowl. There were so many IVs. I mean, yeah. he was on like 14, 16 different medications. He was covered in one of those like bubble blankets trying and they to were heat heating him up. his skin up, trying to get blood flow back. Um, and practicing medicine. You know, he would, they're just trying to keep his heart going. Even before they told us it was MSSA and sepsis, they told us early on that he would most likely lose all four limbs. I mean, if he made it, he would most likely lose all four limbs. I mean, that was within <laughs> the very beginning. And then I would say a couple days into it, then they said it was MSSA. It was acting like MRSA, right. but technically MSSA, which is like a super common strand of staff. Mm -hmm. um, and then just, it just, some, some nasty bacteria got into his bloodstream and that's when he went into septic, septic shock. shock yeah. Septic shock can be caused by bacteria, either the bacteria themselves or something in their cell wall that's particularly irritating to the body. But if you have an infection and the infection is uncontrolled, then either bits and pieces of the bacteria or the toxins will make your blood pressure drop because your your heart can't pump because your blood vessels are all dilated. That's why his skin was red, because it was the blood vessels were opening up to allow his white blood cells to come in and find the bacteria. But once your blood vessels open up, there's so much more blood volume for your heart to pump. You end up losing oxygen going to critical tissues. And, and that's what happened to Bowden. The heart just couldn't pump blood to all parts of his body. His arms and legs lost blood supply and oxygen, kidneys, virtually every organ. Here we are 72 hours earlier, you know, previously, is this perfectly healthy little boy and then now here you are in a hospital and he's dying. He's dying. Yeah. And uh, to go from that in such a short time frame span is so, shows you how, how crazy this sepsis is, right? It's just, it's a nasty, quick-moving disease, and uh, no one could have prepared you for that, for sure. Him continuing to breathe was um, too much work for him. He wasn't able to do it. He was using every ounce of energy just to fight the infection, and that's what we did in the MRI suite. He was intubated for 
for weeks while he was going through this. Bowden is um, on a breathing tube for two weeks and they're, they have a wound vax on his arms, both arms, on his hands, on his legs. He may have gotten his whole blood volume transfused after the first surgery because of the amount of blood he was losing and, and for us to keep up. Meanwhile, we're staying at Ronald McDonald House and going through this up and down emotional roller coaster of, is he gonna make it? Is he gonna have arms? Is he gonna have legs? This incredible amount of unknown for your, your child, um, this roller coaster. So then you, you think um, shortly there, you know, three, four days in, I was on a run and I went across the 805 bridge and I'm like, oh my gosh, I could just jump off this thing right now and call it because you just want the pain to end, right? Mm -hmm. I know for, I can speak on both our rehabs, like kind of the turning point of um, like our faith. Yeah. I hand, you know, it's kind of like, let go, let God. It's in God's hands now, and um, it was the only way to, to move forward. We did not realize that we weren't going to leave the hospital the same day. We yeah. thought we were going to get an x-ray, <laughs> and that's it. We and didn't be think good to go, you he know? was going to be there for 75 days. We didn't think that we were going to go on vacation and not hang out with the other family we went with, that we had planned this yeah. for months and months, and we didn't think that... Um, our other two kids that came with us, we didn't think we'd be separated from them for yeah. two and a half months. And yeah. um, and I mean, and our parents didn't get to come visit us. Um, yeah. Nobody nobody was allowed in the PICU. Yeah. I mean, however, they did make an exception right. after Bowdoin had been there for four or six weeks. Um, one of the attendings, Dr. Ravine, made special arrangements and got special permission. <laughs> um, I think he explained the situation. It was a unique situation to where our other kids were in another state and they let the girls come visit Bowdoin. And, and good friends brought him out, you know, twice. I worked a lot with this, his sisters because they had a lot of misconceptions of being worried that if they were to hug him or touch him, that they would also get what he had and that they could lose their legs. So I know I did a lot of um, education with them regarding what happened to him and addressing those misconceptions with them. There was no, we had no idea we'd be there two and a half months. Like we thought three days, maybe they put a bandage, give something quick and off we go. What seemed like, you know, a, a mile scratch um, has now turned into something life-threatening. So. That's all they were telling us in the beginning. Your son is so sick. And as a parent, you're like, okay, like the flu, a cold, like strep throat. Like, what do you mean sick? Because as a parent, I know about broken bones and, you know, yeah. general sicknesses, but not like the kind of sick they were describing. Yeah. I didn't know it was like dying sick. It's difficult to, to not only have that conversation with them, but to also make sure that they're comprehending and understanding what you're saying. We knew early on that he was going to lose limbs. That same day, him getting admitted to the PICU, his skin went from like a little bit of blotch to completely like purple all the way up. Man. His arms so and fast. all the way so up fast. to his upper thighs, like completely purple and um, you're watching this happen in the doctors and you're, you're thinking, can't you do like a stent? And they say, oh, that's for um, veins and, and arteries and, you know, transplants and this. And they're just, once those capillaries close, man, there's nothing that will, till the body seems that it's safe. And they even did geosequencing testing on us for him to see if he had a weak immune system, which was not the case. Everything they tested for came back normal. But the weird side note to that is since he was a baby, mm -hmm. he would get everything known to mankind. Like he was kind of like a sickly baby. Yeah. So my motherly instinct was like, oh, Something I think wrong, he has a yeah. weak immune system. I always told people, Bowdoin has a weak immune system and we need to be careful. And especially during COVID, like I was OCD yeah, yeah. about being really careful with Bowdoin because there was, I don't know if it was some sort of intuition that I had, yeah. but he Which just- the, And then the doctors say, oh, everything's normal. It's not, that was from his sister. Yeah, so I was Getting off. him sick. <laughs> but maybe it was the motherly yeah. intuition. I don't so they know. did there these tests. So then all these tests came back and there's even more reasons to why nobody knows why it happened. They don't know where he picked it up. They don't know if it was when he fell on his bike. When we were here in Havasu, he touched something. They have no idea where he got it, where it came from and why. You know, it's a, a one-off and one in a million and it is what it is. And uh, just so unfortunate for him, for sure.
It took us a few days to start telling any friends. I mean, it took us a while. We probably told our parents immediately. I put a lot of thought yeah. into how I could connect the people that were praying for Bowdoin and for us and bring them into the journey um, in a positive way. Um, and so Thank I... Thank God for that. <laughs> yeah. Early on, she's like, hey, we have two options. We either this happened and we got to go down this road or we go down this road and it's a very dark, deep, deep hole. And we either go with our faith and go this or go this route and it's not going to end up well. And thank God I had her because she supported me and our family. I mean, the faith was really, really strong for her. And she started writing and blogging and uh, made a lot of sense to a lot of people. And that was her outlet too and always finding a blessing, right? Mm -hmm. One of my good friends in Phoenix started like a group thread for oh, yeah. texting, texting yeah. and she said, do you want to name this? It was just all my good friends and family members, right. not like a whole ton of people, just a really small, intimate circle of family yeah. and friends. She's like, let me name this group something. And I was like, uh, Bowdoin's blessings. You're all his little blessings. And so then that just kind of spiraled. And then it got me thinking when we were in that dark place to focus on mm -hmm. the littlest things that I could mm -hmm. focus on, like walking down the long hospital hallways. There was lots of windows and mm -hmm. I'd make myself look out the window and mm -hmm. decide the sky is a really beautiful blue today or <laughs> sorry, the sunset looks really pretty or little things like Dr. Ravine's voice is so soft and so sweet or that nurse's hair looks really pretty. I mean, it was like the most trivial little things that I would like not be able to go to bed that night until I picked what was the blessing of that day. And we would just, we would choose. This was their worst nightmare come true. And there were so many unknowns that they went through. And I remember Jules telling me, she said, I have a verse every day. She goes, I try to find a blessing in every day. Even if it's the hardest day, I find a blessing and that's what I try to fixate on. From uh, 9 a.m. in the morning when he got there, 8.30, 9 a.m. till uh, 9 p.m., his legs were then completely purple up to his knees. Up, his arms were purple. Um, that's when they did the surgery, and from that point on, the discoloration just worsened every day. And the surgeries continued there. So the very next day, the ne very next morning, the orthopedic surgeon at that time came in and um, said, he's going to lose all of his limbs. <laughs> On day right two, now we're yeah, just trying to three, keep him yeah. alive. So how do you take that? <laughs> yeah, so we, we had to process that for a little bit. So he was in the pick you for two months right. and he had surgeries about every couple days. In they the call beginning. them washouts, right? Yeah, clean outs. Clean it's out. like a Trying to clean power the back. washer cleaning out all of the <laughs> tissue. Yeah. tissue. Which so. every time he had to be under anesthesia, which then he didn't like. So every surgery he had, I would contact the anesthesiologist that was assigned to his case that day and I would advocate for a bedside induction and I knew like in those moments, Jules was there, Brian was there, I was there, and we would all just either sing songs, watch Blippi, or just be there with him so it went as smoothly as possible. So that was every two days they do this. So right when he was starting to come out off the anesthesia and feel better. It was like they'd like knock, knock him down again. <laughs> knock him out. And this yep. went on for weeks and then a month. And then finally I'm like, hey man, how many more surgeries? Like it's, and then Jules made the point where two weeks in and um, they knew that he, you know, was probably um, stable from a uh, going to heaven standpoint. Um, and then trying to refocus on his limbs. And every single day during these two, you know, first it was days, then it turned into weeks and then all these surgeries and then it turned into a month. And every day you're praying, oh, is there gonna be blood flow? Let's see some pink down yeah, below. Yeah, we would think we were seeing pink, but. And I'm like, hey, he's got pink on this leg. And they're like, well, yeah, he does, <laughs> but they, I mean, there was blotches and whatnot, but yeah. um, so you had hope. Because there was no blood flow anymore, um, they, you know, they hardened, I guess it was gangrene, gangrene at that yeah. point, and in the metal hospital bed, he, he could still move his leg and it would hit the side of the, yeah. the metal part, and um, I think his ortho was maybe giving us time, but I reached that 
acceptance um, that it was time to let go because his hard leg would hit the metal hospital bed and it was like metal it, it just sounded like metal hitting metal and I was like okay we it's time they did the um the first amputations were below the knee amputations and they did that on um November 2nd mm -hmm. and uh it didn't take, there was still infection in his legs. Um, so they had to amputate again, I think four days later. And at that point we're just like, how much more of our boy are you gonna take? You know, and just losing parts of him right before our eyes. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. I'm on the computer looking, okay, he's above above uh, knee amputation better or below knee. So then I'm, I pushed and said, hey man, can we give him a shot and try be below the knee first because that's easier for prosthetics. And then you sit back and you're like, whoa, what are we saying? What are we talking about? Like, what do we know? I mean, and, and now we're talking about our son's not gonna have legs and you're trying to comprehend that and now you're focusing on which part of his legs you're gonna try to keep. So, I mean, the hospital was really admirable that they even, I, they probably knew that it wasn't gonna work, but at that point to make us happy to try, they, yeah. there was hope there. Yeah. And um, so, even prior to that, they would, different people would come into our room and deliver us um, articles about amputees, or they yeah. had different people in different departments start talking about um, what a wonderful life he's gonna have as an amputee. They, they made an appointment for us to go to hangar prosthetics. He had, didn't even have the amputations done yet. Like they were trying to prepare us, yeah. but we were definitely in denial. I Absolutely, mean, I was yeah. not, I was not there yet. Um, I thought I was going to have some sort of miraculous healing happen every like, morning, right? Yeah. Wake up and you're like, it's going to happen today. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. um, I, I really thought, you know, we, I know a lot of friends and families and strangers were praying, um, for us, there were days I didn't even pray. Mm -hmm. Um, because I was so exhausted mentally that I knew we were being lifted up by so many people that it sounds mm. terrible. It's like I almost like would take a break from it because it just consumed our life, which was a beautiful thing as mm. it should. But um, I, I, I was just waiting for this healing that you would read about in the Bible. Yeah. And um, it wasn't happening. And then we really, we really started questioning our faith. Absolutely. I mean, I, I mean, and I'll go on record all day long. I'm asked, telling her one day, I'm like, oh, God is great. Everything's like this is meant to be and we trust in him. And then the next day, what God allows him to be born, allows her to be pregnant, allows him to be born, allows him to live and breathe oxygen for three years and then allows him to get sick and allows this to happen. Why, 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 why? All these questions, right? What Which did we I, do as parents? Right. What did I do as a child? What, did, yeah, our like, sons, what yeah. did I do that this is now a reflection? He had not opened his eyes yet. There was no sign of life yeah. from other than Still on the, the breathing tube, right? Breathing for him. Yeah. I had this really strange feeling talking to my child who was intubated. It was just weird, like to sing him songs or talk and to so to say a prayer over him out loud when we would, it just always felt strange because it was just like a body was there. Our chaplain said a prayer out loud and yeah. um, I'm definitely feeling strange inside. Yeah. Like this just doesn't feel right. And um, as soon as he closed the prayer, Bowden's eyes like popped Lit open up. really <laughs> huge and then closed him and we were all like, whoa, hey, so if you don't believe in God, then now you do. Not sure. Was, <laughs> and he has a breathing tube, right? It was, I mean, it's like a bone chilling Intense. experience that I feel fortunate to have had that, even though the circumstance was terrible. It was yeah. just really beautiful. Once we knew that Bowden's amputation date was set, the kindergarten teacher and me, needed to have his little feet painted and mm -hmm. made into a footprint that I could remember forever. Um, I used to always do handprints and footprints for all my kindergarten students to give to their families. So I've always cherished footprints and handprints. And mm -hmm. I remember the child life specialist and 
the uh, social worker and maybe some nurses were trying to talk me out of that. They were yeah. like, I don't know, that could be a trigger later down the road. They really didn't think it was a good idea. And I was like, no, I want to remember how small his little foot was. And maybe they were trying to talk me out of it also because they knew it was going to be really difficult to get a footprint of a hardened yeah. foot. Um, but we did it. We all together, <laughs> we painted his little foot and um, they, they put his print on I guess it's like a stepping stone yeah. or something and then I chose my one of my favorite uh, scriptures to have included with it and they sent it to our house we finally got it gosh months later a few mon no it's right? like a, a, over a year later I thought they forgot about it and I just got yeah. it a few months ago and it's uh -huh. in the box I haven't opened it and I don't know if there's going to be a, a right time to open it but I just know we have his little footprint in a box. We had to sign papers and they're like, okay, we'll do the amputation on this Friday, I believe, right? Yeah. And you're like, okay. And we're talking and praying about it. And and then they, they, they pushed him out and you're like, this is the last time you're going to see him, even though they're, his legs were non-living for sure at that point. Um, to see him go out and then come back, you're like, Phew. and then. And then when he came back, I wanted to look, but I didn't want to look. Um, so I didn't for a while. And then I think the social worker came in and was kind of giving us tips on how to tell yeah. him, you should tell him ASAP. And I'm like, this is not a, a conversation I can just yeah. drop real quick. Like I have to, grasp I gotta get it, some headspace. Know? I'm still trying to grasp what just happened. The next day after the surgery, um, the blanket was off for some reason. And I, I know he could see his legs and I, I don't know if he realized what exactly happened, but he was looking down. They were um, just bandaged up. And then I remember him yeah. looking at the photos of himself with his legs. And I'm pretty sure like he was smart as a whip, like he would hear conversations. <laughs> and I just remember him looking at the pictures and um, he didn't talk for a few days. Like it yeah. was like he went through this little depression, depression. and yeah. maybe he was starting to process things. Um, but we had this plan that we were gonna tell him together. When Bowden was more awake, I helped Jules and Brian navigate the conversation of how to tell him about his legs. Bowden asked me a question and we just kind of, I explained in child terms, um, your legs got really sick and in order to save your life, they had to remove the sick parts and you're going to get new types of legs are going to look different, but you'll still be able to walk and run. So I'm having this conversation with Bowden and no one else is in the room. He's not there. And I'm like, oh my gosh, is this really happening right now? Am I telling my child he doesn't have legs? It, it was definitely um, and then, a hard conversation yeah, to have. Incredibly difficult. But then we'd always... Um, try so hard to be positive with Bowden. Mm -hmm. I would try not to cry in front of him. Um, yeah. I would try to just give him all the sunshine I had and, and make everything super positive because he could feed off of our energy yeah. like any kid can. So we found it really important um, to stay positive in front of him. And He loved watching Blippi and Peppa Pig. We would watch him for hours on end. He's a crack up. He was so funny and he, if he did not want you in his room, he had no problem saying like, go away. <laughs> and he did multiple times to multiple people, but there were his people that he had where he could be having the worst day ever and he wanted us there with him. He had to get wound care on his legs. He had to get wound care on his back. He had wound care on his arms and hands. I mean, and it was awful. My name is Tess Aberg and I'm a wound and ostomy care nurse at Rady Children's Hospital. So I was Bowden's wound care nurse in regards to changing his dressings um, and wound vacs to his uh, legs and to his arms, uh, both before, during, and after his amputation to his legs. They would have to knock him out. They'd give him anesthesia to do the wound care um, because he would just scream mm. so much that he'd lose his voice. We stayed in the beginning just 
as worried parents, but yeah. after a while, the wound care nurses would have us leave and, and, and not be there for it because those are just um, visions that nobody should ever have. It got better over time. <laughs> At first, um, Bowden's dad really couldn't be in the room. It was really hard for him to see, understandably so. Um, and his mom would stay in the room, but typically in the back. Um, but as time go on, went on and they, they trusted what was happening and understood more what was happening, they were able to be a part of it. He's still on antibiotics through the pick line and they don't want infections because I'm like, hey, maybe you should, we should all take a break from the dressing changes and let him heal. Just he he had it, that wound care, intense wound care for, I mean, since the first round of the amputations, that was November 2nd. His wounds weren't healed. He still had wound care to be done after he left our hospital. So we had to spend a few weeks, month, to train the parents. How would they continue to do that wound care? We had to get trained the last couple weeks no. in order for him to be discharged. We had to get trained in wound care, and he had to get trained in how to give blood thinner shots. I mean, we- Twice a day in his arm. It was like we became insta-nurses slash doctors. I never wanted to be a nurse. <laughs> <laughs> well, we were now. They really took that on, but it was a it was a growing thing <laughs> over the over the time that he was here. <laughs> they, his hands were stuck like this for so long. He could literally just uh, watch TV. That's all he or iPad. He couldn't move his hands because they were all bandaged up like this. His legs. And this is the whole time before amputation. Everything he was like this. And then they'd check his arms and. Um, the plastic surgeon came in and he's like, oh, and they let it sit for a while because he was starting to show um, signs of improvement and in both arms. And then he's like, oh, we went and looked at the other one and I went ahead and took two of the fingers off because they just fell off. And I'm like, whoa! At that point, you're like, well, at least he has three on that hand now, right? Like, and his left finger would be just for balancing at best. And then through all the physical therapy and um, occupational therapy, he was using that very finger to put a bead and a string through it, right? The very thing that they said he would barely be able to use, he's putting beads, holding a bead and putting a string through it, which is a massive task. I fixated on praying for his ring finger um, because, you know, I, he, he will get married one day and I wanted that ring finger and I can't even like, describe until I'm blue in the face about how much I prayed for that ring finger. And that's the only mm. one good finger that's like perfectly perfect on that hand where he lost fingers. And if, like we said, when uh, we were praying over him, and if there, nobody believes in God, then they weren't there what we saw. I mean, and, and for all these people that, um, and hearing the different interviews, how sick he was, and all of them thought that he wasn't gonna make it. Well, little Bowden did, man. and and. Uh, proved them all wrong, that's for sure. Talk about amazing world that doesn't even know Bowdoin. Presence after presence and books and fire trucks coming to Ronald McDonald's house to where they were bringing carts of gifts from complete strangers yeah. that we've never met, Well, my may never ever meet, but one, I mean, just unbelievable yeah. support. One about, of my cousins who lives lived in El Cajon, um, he knew a person that worked for one of the news channels. Yeah. And so once that story got out yeah. and <laughs> the San Diego community saw yeah. the story, that's when this community that we aren't even part of like came together Unreal, yeah. and they were praying for us and delivering things to Bowdoin. And um, Thanksgiving. like this big city of San Diego mm. smelled like a little Havasu town yeah. just filled with love and support from this community we didn't know. And I mean, it didn't even stop there. It just Kept all going. across the nation. I would um, receive messages from people praying. So once we finally got to leave, when you leave, um, nurses line up the hallways and sing like a goodbye song, and they're cheering for the kids who are finally getting discharged. And we did that, and then it's like we walked out into the open world, and we're like, "Holy cow! We're putting this child in the car seat, and we're driving from the hospital to the airport," <laughs> which was which was good <laughs> enough for me. <laughs> and we could see him in that rear view mirror. Um, and uh, we got on that airplane, and, and oh my gosh, Brian was so afraid to fly, and I was like. I will tell you right now, God is not going to do this today. Like, so not after all too. of that, you are fine. Like, it's fine. We're getting home safely. Not today. How did I feel when it was time to be discharged? So ready to go home and see our children, for sure. My anxiety was, I don't know, 1 to 10 was a 365. 
about whether he was gonna get infection, am I able to give him shots, am I able to help wound care. wound care, is he gonna be okay, is he gonna get COVID, we have 24 hour nurse care. At early on, Bowdoin had 24 hour in PICU, he had 24 hour care. There was a dialysis nurse, uh, the attendings, uh, all these different, four, six people in the room at every minute of the day for 24 hours a day, all for hours. For weeks and weeks and weeks. weeks. And His weeks. room was filled up. So, I, so to leave that and go on our own was, I'll just say I prayed a ton for sure. We got home mm -hmm. and um, we- Landed. We, yes, we did. We landed safely mm -hmm. and um, right there, we were greeted by friends and our two girls, and there was some fire trucks, and then... Um, and, we do, and to hold our, our girls came running up, and to hold them that first time is like, man, we're home. Even though this so scared. The, <laughs> when we turned out <laughs> of the airport is oh when gosh. we saw yeah. people lined up with... Um, On the streets with balloons. balloons and signs and just fire trucks and police cars and ambulances and I remember thinking like <laughs> it's so silly I remember thinking like do I record this I really want to remember this and show Bowden but yeah. I want to watch this and yeah. it was like this weird thing in my head but I like it was um like probably 20 different sheriffs and fire department yeah, and all this like just waiting there for us. It was and incredible. Nobody, it was and like, then I was like, oh my gosh, what an how amazing... long have they been waiting here for us? And I felt so bad special, that special people were place, just man. taking their time out of their own days to, to welcome him home. And that, you know, that was a really special day. You know, we got home on December 21st, so four days before Christmas. And at that point, um, there was talk of maybe being able to see the Star of Bethlehem. And that night we saw it and we we got a picture of Bowdoin below the star of Bethlehem and I was like this is yeah this it, is godly this and, is and we all amazing. slept in our our bed all five of us that night and an earthquake couldn't have woken us up <laughs> like we were done <laughs> we all just snuggled right uh, yeah all all five that of us first in night. our bed it was a little squishy but it was amazing it was amazing After getting home with Bowdoin, um, well, we got to celebrate Christmas four days later. So it was Christmas blessings mm -hmm. abound. Um, and then for months and months afterwards, it was wound care for us. Um, and then we'd have nurses come to our house a few times a week in the beginning. Yeah. And then after months went by, like once a week, just to make sure there wasn't infection brewing um, for the dressing changes for dressing and then changes. The, Bowdoin would see him come and he's like oh here we go again <laughs> and then we the think we're part. out of the clear we've been home two weeks and then uh, one of he had a bunch of scarring on the fingers that had amputation or that the two fingers that fell off we drove to Phoenix to the children's hospital there and he saw the the red cross or yeah on, at the hospital oh man outside and he's like are we at a hospital and we were like Oh, yes, yeah. maybe, but <laughs> he just lost it. Yeah. He did not want to go. And so they Poor had guy. to do surgery yeah. on, we thought it was the one finger and there ended up being another finger yeah, that had two exposed or three. bones. He had to have one more surgery. He had a skin graft on his arm to cover up the, the wounds. And, and thank God that uh, plastic surgeon said, hey, this is never gonna heal. Yeah. We need to make a small incision and get it to heal because it'll yeah. just be mushy forever go forever and that was his 20th my story. god yeah so then hopefully knock on wood that that's all done now <laughs> no more surgeries he couldn't start any kind of therapies until dressing changes were done yes he couldn't correct. get yep. prosthetics until dressing changes were done so we were, we were really wanting to finish the dressing have the legs healed because then you could get prosthetics and then we went to get a um a pediatric or orthopedic x-ray done by somebody that really knows what they're doing, right? And in Phoenix, and 
he says, oh, he has a, um, a fracture in his femur. And you're like, what? A broken leg? <laughs> no, How does that even happen? no, no. He's been like yeah, I forgot about scooting that. around. He's not on anything higher than the couch. Like there's Which no he way. He probably got it. He fell off the couch one of the days on the carpet. But that's who knows how where? But like, and then he goes, "Oh, but you can still get prosthetics." And we're like, "Yes." Even with the femur, he's like, "Yeah, there's no weight on there. It's all in the hip." So he cleared him for prosthetics, and then they were um, like little trainer. Yeah. Little trainer little legs. Trainer so legs once he got those, flat. and he got to start. Physical therapy, started in full swing, occupational therapy. Um, back at school back with the legs. Back at school, which was really scary with, with his, Germ Central. With his um, trainer legs on. Yep, so now he's in full prosthetics. Um, he's learning how to ride a Strider bike. Yeah. He has occupational therapy on Tuesdays. He's learning to re-swim again on Wednesdays. He has an occupational mm. therapist come to school on Thursdays, and then a physical therapist come to school on Thursdays, and then goes to physical therapy on Fridays. Good job. That was good. See if you can hit it all the way to dad. Hit it hard. Yeah. Ooh. Ooh, you gotta hit the <laughs> ball, not the teeth. <laughs> Grab another pancake. There you go. Who made that truck? I did. Grab one for now and we'll do two next time. Let's put it on top of that same one. Good Walk, thank you. Walk through the middle. There you go. Fast. Go fast all the way to That is pretty fast. Go fast. Well, we ought to get the sock on. Can you put that sock on? Ooh, that was good. Feel good? All right, stand up and see if you can get some more clicks. So we have t-shirts that say, I love PT. <laughs> OT, too. OT. <laughs> um, so he's, yeah. A lot of our weeks are, are uh, Meanwhile, therapy. back at the ranch, we have two other children that have that are in and swim and dance and all this fun stuff too. So everyone's busy doing their things. But there's a lot more physical help that he needs. So then, um, without <laughs> yeah. getting our daughters upset or mm. jealous, um, we're still we trying to, balance, to figure out yeah. that balance. And I yeah. think we will for exactly. years to come. Because how can you not have so much energy focus into getting him better and be unable to do normal things yeah. when all of us can do normal things, right. right? And then as a parent of a special needs child is a whole nother thing. Like with his immune system, letting him go to school with germs is a, a thing of itself. And mm -hmm. the fact that he'd rather scoot on the ground than put his legs on. Scooting for him is easier and faster. He's like a little monkey boy um, without his legs on. It takes a lot more concentration and physical yes, work to walk with his prosthetics and heavy. on. Yeah, they're heavy. Other needs of a special needs parents are like little things like, um, are we going to find wheelchair parking? Yeah. Are we, or handicap parking? Are we going to, like we stress out about little things like that. We, stairs, stairs, um, elevators, taking them out in public. There's been times, I mean, just last night, I, we took them to Shogun for dinner and he wanted his legs <laughs> off at the table, but then we made him keep his <laughs> liners on that have like little screws on the end of the liners to, to <laughs> clip on into the legs. Anyway, yeah. he had to go to the bathroom. So I got to take him to the bathroom and there were three little kids in there all staring and so I opened up the conversation of he he was born. You guys might be wondering what this is all about. He was born with legs just like you guys were. He got sick and just kind of opened up that conversation for them. And they're like, oh, I know somebody with a prosthetic arm. Oh, mm -hmm. but um, being out in public in the very beginning was hard for us. Yeah. Um, Especially in with, we'd always put him in longer pants to cover his legs. Well, how's he supposed to be covered? comfortable in his legs when we're covering them up. Right. Right? Just because other people we may were, not be doesn't mean that... It might be. Well, we were worried about the mm -hmm. comfort of other people. Like, how often do people yeah. really see somebody with missing limbs or those missing parts <clears throat> exposed? I, I don't know. It was a weird thing that we were 
um, adjusting to. Yeah. And so <laughs> one time I took him to Phoenix, he had to go to the bathroom to pick up his legs or some, some sockets or something. And I stopped at a gas station and he was just in a diaper. And I'm like, oh, and he had to go to the bathroom really, really bad. So I went into the gas station off the I-10 and the guy looks at me and his face just kind of went like this. And I took him in the bathroom and I walk up and I got like him a little cookie or, and some water. And he's like, free banana for you. <laughs> free I, would banana. Say, I would say for us really, <laughs> that's the biggest thing is that the whole, um, yeah. how to handle it in public with people looking because i don't think people are looking to be mean they're looking wondering yeah. was he born like that or did that just happen and it happens every time yeah. we go like i was just in williams last week and the lady at the checkout goes to, she looks at Bowden. i wish everybody would say this yeah but people don't know what to say a lot of times she says he looks like a survivor and i was like he yeah. is a survivor because she survivor. could see his skin and then we started talking about the story but i think a lot of people just kind of I'm and I think, and you know, in a world that seems so negative too, I think most people genuinely are like, they see it as um, they're genuinely um, concerned or there's no negativity towards them, you know, especially as the older people or older adults, kids, I mean, can go either way. Of course, kids are kids, but, and I'm sure there'll be some Which is a worry. barriers like, down the road for sure. But and... right. 90% of the time people are super, um, accepting of him and ask questions and it's pretty pretty amazing to actually witness you think you'd be the opposite well, but sometimes he, those are our own insecurities yes, right yes those are ours and he just has a a really cool personality like he's happy he's, um sunlight he's light he's he's sunshine for sure and people are drawn to his sunshine even through the hard times, he found something somehow to laugh about it. And he just thrived. And I think he thrived because of that grit that he had in him. Bowden hasn't necessarily had to advocate for himself. Um, at school, the first few days, uh, kids were like, where did your legs go? What's wrong with your hands? Why are you missing fingers? And he would look at whoever was asking him the question yeah. and be like, I got sick. They They're had gone. to save my life. They're gone. And then they turn around and start playing again. <laughs> Trucks like, and stuff. Kids are cool. Yeah, <laughs> like, kids are that, amazing. That's it. There would be kids like on the playground that would be like, Bowden. And, and like, like kids rock like star. cheering for him. So special. Or, Good job walking. Like it's just like this little family. And that if we didn't have that, I don't know <laughs> yeah. where he would be or where we would be. But um, our little Calvary family at school has it was been like a huge, huge stepping stone for him to be like, OK, this is how it is. Here we go. Yeah. You no, know, like nobody was, has made him feel mm -mm. unaccepted yeah. or everyone's been supportive, super for sure. loving and supportive. How we continue to get through everything is to not take any days for granted, to not, I mean, to not take anything for granted, even the tiny things like mm -hmm. fingers or our legs or all the things that we forget to be thankful for. And stay strong, right? Stay strong, be sad, be strong. Every day is a hard day. It could be a good day, a bad day, but it's a day in the right direction for right. us. And then to not complain, <clears throat> no. like we catch ourselves when you'd yeah. be like, oh, I'm tired today, or oh my, I'm, I'm sore from what <laughs> sleeping, I don't know, just little things. And then we catch ourselves yeah. um, rather than to complain, to look what is going well. Yeah. And to, again, to, to find the blessing right. amongst <laughs> the storm, you know, the basic look yeah. for those blessings, make lemonade out of lemons. And that's really kind of what we've learned. And families got to stick together, man, yes. for sure. As, as <clears throat> Bowden would have done to all of his nurses and doctors at the hospital. <laughs> We're the Bob Kirshner family. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Say, hi, I'm Bowden. Hi, I'm Bowden. Sepsis survivor.